Oui. Ah, oui, c'est la Oui. Oui, au niveau national, comme vous avez parlé, localement, un Bon, pas de Ok, Yannick, je pense que euh, vous avez commencé. Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue à la Cross Canada Lecture Tour. Le Cross Canada Lecture Tour est donné deux fois par année par le section national de la Société canadienne en géotechnique. Euh, C'est financé par la Société, elle s'est organisée. Notre directeur est ici, M. Le Breton, pour la Société nationale. Au niveau local, tu as François Duhaime, le président, Alain Plaisant, le vice-président. Et entre notre présentateur est M. Thomas O'Rourke de Cornell University. Uh, <coughs> je voudrais vous remercier uh, ETS. Oh, ici. <laughs> je voudrais remercier l'École Technologie Supérieure pour le, le salle ici, la technologie avec le système Zoom. Uh, et aussi, particulièrement, um, Yannick Etier de ETS. <coughs> Uh, si tu es sur le Zoom, tu peux voir la présentation. Uh, je pense que tu dois changer l'anglais pour la personne sur so, so, so If you're on the Zoom system and watching the presentation, you can uh, ask questions at the end of the presentation using the chat feature in Zoom, and uh, Yannick will read the question. Or you can ask Yannick to unmute you and ask your question yourself, in which case uh, Dr. Rourke will respond. Uh, Dr. Rourke est un anglophone, donc la présentation sur en anglais, mais je vais lui présenter en anglais uh, pour cette raison. <coughs> Thomas O'Rourke is the Thomas R. Briggs Professor of Engineering in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, a distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, an international fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, a member of the Mexican Academy of Engineering and the fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. O'Rourke has received a number of distinctions for his research and his teaching, including the Stephen D. Bechtel Award for Pipeline Engineering and the Ralph B. Peck Award from the ASCE. In 2016, he received the George W. Houster Award for contributions to earthquake engineering. He gave the 2009 Rankin Lecture and the 2016 Terzaki Lecture. Tom served as president of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute and has participated in many professional society committees. His research interests, his areas of expertise, include geotechnical engineering, earthquake engineering, underground construction technologies, engineering for large geographically distributed systems, and geographic information technologies and database management. He has served on many governmental advisory boards and peer review boards for many different types of projects. Uh, he's been an advisor on more than 120 projects in 13 countries, and he has authored or co-authored almost 400 publications. For well, the presentation today will be on the Boston Central Artery Project. I would like to thank our sponsors. That would be Tetratech, Clifton Associates, Thurber Engineering, and Clone Crippen Berger. Uh, 
for the Neville National, you have uh, financing part the society itself and also part the Canadian Foundation for Geotechnic. Uh, I'd like to all of you to join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Rourke to this presentation. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming to a working lunch today to uh, listen to the first of the, uh, the uh, uh, Cross Canada Touring Lectures. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I love coming to Montreal. It's a lovely city. I've never been to St. John's. That's the next stop on the trip. Then after that, Fredericton. I've never been there either. Quebec, which I've never been to either. And uh, finally, Ottawa. And I have been to Ottawa. So. You have beautiful cities and uh, you have a very active and uh, important practice in geotechnical engineering. Uh, I was talking with a number of the engineers here today. I know that there's plenty of projects in infrastructure, particularly given uh, uh, the emphasis that Canada is placing on with the Trudeau government on infrastructure investments. And then, of course, all of the mining and the uh, natural um, commodities uh, work. So uh, I think things are good. and. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to be able to give this talk. I guess there's a couple of other slides that Wayne wanted me to put up, and that is the, something about the, the CGS membership benefits, and, and those are displayed for you here. And then finally, um, to renew or join CGS. So my talk today is called Lessons Learned uh, for Ground Movements and Soil Stabilization on the Boston Central Artery. Uh, I'm going to talk about the very difficult underground uh, construction conditions that prevailed on the Boston Artery, and then some of the innovative technologies and techniques which were put together uh, to be able to address these issues. And, and some of them really came as quite surprising. And uh, even though the Boston Artery was constructed uh, about a decade ago, it was finished, I think some of these lessons are still being learned and are important for practice uh, whenever you're dealing with especially weak and troublesome soils. So, first of all, what are the value of case histories? Well, first of all, they're real. Uh, they actually tell us something about what actually happens, and so we learn from reality to be able to apply that without any adornments to the next reality we have to deal with, the next job. They, they involve the full complexity of real world conditions. And so working through a case history tells us something about what were the uncertainties and how those were adjusted to, and then what were the wrong decisions that were made, and therefore the correct results that would come from making an initial error, which then hopefully will save other people from making those initial errors. They provide uh, explicit and important imperial guidance, uh, empirical guidance, and. Uh, they provide a true test for our analytical and numerical models, and sometimes they provide some surprising insights, as I think you'll find when we talk about some of the issues on the Boston Artery. Finally, the importance of case histories can be summed up in the quote from George Santana, who said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, it sounds rather with a lot of gravitas, right? But, but we all know that we don't want to repeat mistakes that have been made before, and learning from those experiences of the past help us to avoid that particular issue. So here is a picture of Boston uh, from the air. And you can see this beautiful green space that surrounds the central part of Boston. And that used to be full of a elevated transportation um, system uh, that was called Interstate 93. And that opening up of space not only made Boston a much more livable place, but it provided an extraordinary impetus for all sorts of investments along the waterfront and literally hundreds of billions of dollars of investment and um, infrastructure expansion, new businesses, etc., cetera, uh, that's made Boston a very, very solid city today. So when we talk about uh, infrastructure projects, we talk about the Boston Artery, it's not just a transportation project, it's actually an urban regeneration project that has paid back its initial investments many, many times. The topics I'm going to address are the Boston Central Artery and Tunnel, give you some perspective, deep soil mixing technology, case histories, and then lessons that 
we learn from these case histories as, as a set of summary comments. So let's start with the Boston Artery and Tunnel Project, often abbreviated as CA slash T. In the 1950s, there were about 70,000 vehicles per day traveling on the elevated viaducts, which went through this central strip in Boston, which we now saw on that last slide, uh, which is green space. By the time the 1990s came around, there was about 190,000 vehicles per day. And uh, literally, you would be stuck in a traffic jam for at least 10 out of 24 hours. The congestion was really uh, very serious at the time. So the Boston Central Artery set about maintaining the elevated transportation network associated with Interstate 93 and Interstate 90. They're two, two major arteries, two major highways that uh, service Boston. And keeping that going while at the same time they dug immediately underneath them uh, an expansion of that transportation network in the form of underground tunnels, either built through open cut construction or underground construction technologies to provide for 250,000 vehicles per day. <clears throat> Peter Zook, who was one of the managers of the artery construction, likened the building of the central artery to a patient who was having open heart surgery and insisted on playing tennis and smoking cigarettes at the same time. It was a, a very difficult process to keep all this going. So, what you see on the right-hand side of this slide is a map of Boston with the Interstate 93 and the Interstate 90. You'll see a, a, a kind of a wiring diagram where 93 and 90 intersect with each other. There was a tremendous amount of specialized construction that had to occur there. You'll see that I-90 goes underneath Boston Inner Harbor in what's called the Ted Williams Tunnel. Um, like every good tunnel, it's not necessarily named after the, the engineer, right, who did, built the uh -huh. tunnel. It's named after, in this case, a famous baseball player. Uh, and that provided an alternative route to Logan Airport, which was only serviced by two tunnels, uh, the Sumner and the Callahan Tunnel, which were generally jammed most times of the day and created real difficulty getting to the airport. So it evolved 260 lane kilometers of interstate highway, I-93 beneath Boston, maintaining the current I-93, the I-90 extension to Logan Airport, the Ted Williams Tunnel, the I-90-93 interchange, and over 250 construction projects of, of major substance and magnitude. The Boston Artery was thought about way back in the 1950s, that is, building it underground rather than keeping it above ground. Uh, and, uh, the original estimates, and these of course were extraordinarily optimistic, was at about $110 million. I'm sure the concept was much simpler in the 50s. When the artery was uh, finally constructed, and I have 2004 there, but the actual number should be 2006, uh, the cost uh, had come in at about $14.7 billion. That's very expensive, and uh, there was a number of criticisms leveled at the artery as a consequence of the high expense. And uh, I think it's valuable for us, since we're all embarking on major infrastructure projects, to talk a little bit, and I will in this talk, uh, about where those costs come from and uh, what they tell us about uh, how to manage and deal with uh, major construction projects. And also, I'll try to put the artery in historical perspective. We have a number of mega projects, not the least of which is the um, Channel Tunnel, uh, Alaska Pipeline, Panama Canal and so forth, how does the artery stack up against those uh, mega projects? So let's talk a little bit about deep soil mixing technology. And just to, again, to put things in perspective from a time frame, uh, the Boston artery construction started about 1991 and finished about 2006, so about 15 <coughs> years of construction. So we're talking about a lot of political changes, a lot of changes in technology, a lot of things are happening in this time frame. And we put mega projects into perspective, we also have to look at the dynamic of the time frame that really has a strong influence on how they work out. Well, deep mixing method is in situ treatment technology that blends soil with cementitious materials by means of mixing shafts to create a soil mix or a soil cement with a higher strength, a lower compressibility, a lower permeability, 
uh, than those of the native soils which it's replacing. Uh, deep mixing methods involve uh, some fairly specialized rigs. You can see a triple logger rig in one of these pictures. And then they also involve highly computerized ba uh, batching plants where the cementitious materials are blended and mixed uh, to some sort of a water content, typically between 0.8 to 1.25. Uh, you'll often have type 1, type 2 cements, and sometimes you'll have slag and other kinds of, uh, of, of additives which will help lubricate the material. Uh, and they're all computerized and then sent to the augering rigs and mixed in place uh, to create a soil mix or a soil cement. Uh, there's a number of classification methods uh, for deep mixing methods. Uh, this is one that uh, sort of lays out what we call the wet mixing methods as opposed to the dry mixing methods. Uh, the people who developed the dry mixing methods uh, were primarily Scandinavian, uh, a lot of work done in Sweden, where either lime or dry cement is mixed in situ and hydrates with the in situ water content. You don't get as strong a modification of the soil, but it's very uh, flexible. It allows you to get to uh, some unusual places and uh, will provide sufficient strength provided that the loading conditions are uh, um, reasonably low with respect to the loading conditions that you might be able to treat with the wet methods. Um, so the wet methods involve some sort of a grout and then some sort of a rotary method for blending the grout into the ground. Sometimes that rotary method is combined with jetting, so that's a kind of a soil mix, um, jet grout type of operation. And then as we're blending the grout into the ground, uh, we'll get uh, the infusion of the grout material either through the end of the shaft, which is E, or through the actual shaft itself, which is, which is S. So uh, this was a classification method proposed by Donald Bruce, uh, and it's a nice way of looking at this technology. Now, you can see some of the deep soil mixing uh, augers on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side and some of the finished products in the background for this slide. And I think this left-hand picture sort of illustrates a lot of things. It illustrates, for example, why my wife can't understand why I get excited about all this stuff. <laughs> she looks at all that soil, she says, well, that's not very exciting. But um, I think what we'll look at here is we'll see that this technology has been extremely important in solving some major problems that would have uh, actually cost billions of dollars to solve had this not been brought uh, forward and put into place in the Boston artery. What's really interesting about this methodology is, is not so much, although it does include the, the mixing of the cementitious materials with the ground and the ways and means and by, whereby you do that, but it also brings together uh, so many different kinds of geometries that you can create. So in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, you can see 100% treatment where the actual columns of soil cement are intersecting each other. Uh, and then you can see down in the lower left-hand side a grid type where you create cells uh, that of open ground in the middle are surrounded by soil mix panels or columns and you can really reduce the percentage of soil mix you put into place by creating these structures that then because of their three-dimensional structural interaction with the ground actually save substantially on the amount of treatment that you have to supply uh, and still create the same kinds of effects. Uh, maybe not quite as stiff as 100% percentage coverage, but certainly a large fraction of that at a much smaller cost. So there's a geometry of evaluation that goes along with this. Uh, that grid type technology I worked on quite a bit for earthquake and soil liquefaction mitigation. If you get the right kinds of grids in place, you can only treat 25% of the ground and create quite an interlocking structure which will prevent the shear strains from occurring that were normally associated with the generation of liquefaction. So it can be a very effective technology uh, for earthquake um, protection. 
DMM applications involve excavation support walls, as we'll see today, stabilization of deep excavations, as we'll see today, and a lot of the work on the artery, we actually pioneered this, uh, liquefaction mitigation, as I just alluded to, hydraulic cutoff barrier, so it has a role to play in geoenvironmental applications, and it's actually used to fix contaminants in place and has been used for heavy metal fixation at a number of sites that I'm familiar with. Topic now, case histories. And there's two case histories I'm going to talk about. One is the Bird Island Flats contract CO7A1, and you can see that that's located as you go through the Ted Williams Tunnel and are approaching Logan Airport on the right-hand side of that uh, right-hand map. Uh, this was a very big excavation. It was about a kilometer and a quarter long, and it was approximately 100 meters wide. So this is an enormous amount of excavation unloading that goes on. And furthermore, when you're dealing with an excavation that's, uh, that's uh, 100 meters wide, you really can't support it with cross-lot braces. You have to support it with some sort of a tieback system. And the clays that are in many locations along the route of this uh, open excavation are very weak. And they actually developed, and I won't be talking about it in this talk, it's a whole new, uh, whole interesting talk in its own regard, multiple grouting and regrouting technologies to be able to anchor into place um, tiebacks that actually could generate uh, many kilonewtons, 500 kilonewtons, 600 kilonewtons of force in the individual tieback members, uh, and they use that, they develop that technology to be very successful. I'll also talk about Fort Point Channel, which by far was a much larger project, had much, had much greater financial implications for the Boston Artery, that the technology that was uh, learned on Bird Island Flats was actually mobilized uh, and put to use uh, at Fort Point Channel, and then additional lessons were learned. So let's talk about Bird Island Flats. We'll put that into perspective right there. You can see the runways for the uh, Logan Airport. Uh, the construction was right adjacent to the runway. And here is an aerial view. And you'll see that this open 100 meter wide excavation is getting the two inbound and outbound lanes. These box structures are being constructed. And as we progress from the bottom of this picture, the southern part of this picture on the right hand side to the northern part of this picture, you'll see the stages of construction where you have the construction going on, then the next phase, the mat is being poured, and then the next phase, we're still excavating down to open up the ground there uh, to receive the base mat and the other parts of the box structures that are going to form uh, the highway system. You'll see in that purple part, too, that there are two airplanes that are immediately to the uh, right of the excavation. Uh, that was when U.S. Air had not bought American Airlines, and so it was United States Air. And I used to fly from Ithaca to Logan Airport, and I could have been in one of those planes when they were doing that. So I was very interested in this excavation because the stability of the aircraft I was in depended upon it. Uh, and where you see the purple, the excavation went through a, a glacial valley that had been infilled with very soft or weak Boston marine clay. Most of this marine clay was quite deep, uh, in some cases 30 meters deep. Um, most of the cases for this particular location between about 23 and 26 meters. So the behavior of this clay became extremely important uh, in terms of this project and actually uh, led to some very surprising results as we indicated earlier as one of the benefits of doing case history study. So there's the deep Boston marine clay. If we now look at a plan view of the excavation, uh, we've got two cross sections, AA prime and BB prime, and just to put that into perspective for you with regard to the aerial view, I've put that up on the left, and now I'm going to look at both of these cross sections. The AA prime is going to be the cross section that's on the western side, and the BB prime, which is right next to the airport, is going to be the cross-section uh, on the eastern side. So if we take a look at uh, AA over here and we look at BB on the other side, we see a, a deep 
uh, deposit of marine uh, clay, uh, overlain by some organic silt, uh, typically four or five meters in thickness, and granular fill on top. Sometimes it's cohesive fill. This fill tended to be hydraulic fill. Even, even the cohesive part of it was hydraulically placed. And then you'll see immediately below the glacial, uh, the uh, marine clay deposits, which vary in maximum thickness, whether you're at AA or BB prime, uh, in thicknesses from 23.5 meters to 26.5 meters, so quite deep. Uh, we have it underlain by uh, glacial deposits, which are quite stiff and quite strong. And once you can get into them, you can get a good anchorage and support. Uh, the deep mixing walls that were utilized for the Bird Island Flats contract uh, were composed of deep soil mix. Uh, at the time, this was the largest application in North America of deep soil mix. Uh, they were using a triple uh, auger rig. Uh, there are primary panels that are illustrated on the right-hand side. And you can see those as listed as what first, second, and third. And then there was a complete over-augering of the cylinders on the uh, outside or of the uh, first and second with a third panel, which was the secondary panel. And while the soil mix was uh, curing, getting stronger, um, steel uh, wide flange members were dropped into place uh, to create uh, structural reinforcement for these walls. And those steel members were separated by about uh, 1.2 uh, meters, about four feet. Uh, so this was the largest application, as I mentioned before, uh, in North America at the time. And it involved about 30,000 cubic meters of soil mix wall for the entire excavation. And everything went extremely well until we got into these deep Boston marine clays. Uh, this is a, an example of the support system that was used for the walls. Um, they were uh, multiple post-grouted uh, anchors, uh, tiebacks, uh, that were actually anchored in the marine clay. It was far too deep to get below it, uh, so you had to do the anchorage in there. And uh, for the east and west walls, there was anywhere between five or six levels of these tiebacks, the actual depth of the excavation on the eastern side next to the airport was about 20 meters, so quite a deep excavation in deep clays. One of the things we learned in the initial phases of the deep soil mix wall construction was that deep soil mix itself has a hydraulic conductivity of somewhere between one times 10 to the minus 6 uh, to perhaps 1 times 10 to the minus 7. If there's some fracturing in it, it could be as low as 1 times 10 to the minus 5. So if we take a number of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 centimeters per second, it's a reasonably good mass permeability for a soil mix wall. Now when you're putting a soil mix wall in Boston marine clay, the Boston marine clay has a hydraulic conductivity of 10 to the minus 8 centimeters per second. So this is two orders of magnitude less than the best we can get with the soil mix walls. And there was a controversy as to whether or not, since these excavations were going to be open for a fairly long period of time, anywhere between one and two years, whether you had to include hydrostatic pressures in the design of the walls. And it was our position at Cornell that no, you didn't, because you are not relatively pervious relative to the material that you're supporting. Of course, you are in the upper um, fill, because the hydraulic conductivity of that material is 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3 centimeters per second. So your wall is two or three times more uh, higher or lower magnitude of permeability. So there you have to have high, uh, hydrostatic forces, because you get recharge up there. But in the actual clays themselves, we believed that you were going to get dissipation through the wall. In other words, the clay really didn't recognize that the wall was there in large measure. It dropped a little bit ahead across that wall, so there would be a little bit of pressure. But you're going to lose most of that hydrostatic pressure. This was vehemently, um, how can I put it, disputed by, by some of the designers. So the Federal Highway Administration actually paid to put some vibrating wire strain gauges in there. And as you can see in the projection, uh, 
Uh, some of those uh, vibrating wire gauges are measuring relatively very small values. In the upper levels, when you're connected with the, the fills, uh, they're, they're showing uh, pressures that are matching the hydrostatic, but into the clays, they've dropped to very low values indeed. And what we did is we ran a number of finite difference steady state seepage evaluations for various combinations of permeability. And you can see the analytical results shown in this slide. And those analytical results match very well the actual vibrating wire strain gauge measurements. So at the very onset, we were able to learn a lot about what were the design loads in terms of water pressures. Uh, and by the way, the um, steady state seepage conditions, because we were monitoring this continuously as we went along, were established very rapidly at about the same pace as the excavation was being carried down. So we learned that we could actually save significant money because the actual pressure distributions from these steady state seepage simulations are substantially lower than a hydrostatic projection. And therefore, there's a significant cost savings in implementing this knowledge. So, the water pressure observations are the first lesson from our study. The soil mix walls are often regarded as impervious. They've got a hydraulic conductivity of around 10 to the minus 6 centimeters per second. But in reality, a soil mix wall may be relatively pervious to the in-situ clay, and the water pressure behind the wall can be significantly less than hydrostatic. Undrained strength. The method that was used to characterize the undrained strength of the clay in Boston uh, was derived from the great work of, of Chuck Ladd and others at MIT. And they work, and many people do, and it's a, it's a superb method, with the stress history and normalized soil engineering properties method, otherwise known as Shansep. And basically, if we look at the cross-section of the excavation on the left-hand side of the slide, we'll see that you can divide the potential uh, base instability area into a traxial extension, direct simple shear, and direct tra traxial compression zones, uh, where the direct simple shear is really closest to the weighted average undrained strength, so a DSS strength is a very viable um, parameter for characterizing undrained strength in these profiles. Um, you'll see that they are able to characterize that as a function of the current vertical effective stress and the stress history as referenced by the overconsolidation ratio. And these numbers, 0 0.18, 0 0.22, uh, and so forth, are um, values that are frequently used. That 0.22, by the way, for traxial compression should be up at uh, 0.32. Um, so what they did is they sampled the clay uh, and then x-ray radiographed the samples to pick the least disturbed specimens, ran very careful one-dimensional consolidation tests in a variety of different ways on the clay, came up with overconsolidation ratios that you see there, and then converted that with the Shansep method into a zone of undrained shear strength. You'll see there's an MO average that stands for McGinn and O'Rourke, as we looked at these data and gave a, a range of values uh, for the undrained strength. And then uh, Whittle and Ladd, uh, Andrew Whittle and Chuck Ladd came up with a, with a range also. And that dark line in there was the best, our median estimate uh, for our range and for their range, both very close. And those were used uh, in terms of the initial design to, to characterize uh, what the strength of the clay would be and to be able to uh, come up with a design for the temporary support system. Now, what you see on the left-hand side of this slide is an illustration of the valley in which these marine clays were deposited. And these marine clays are not homogeneous. Uh, the United States Geological Survey ran several seismic reflection uh, runs on a number of these marine valleys. 
and we're able to detect continuous lines of sediment in terms of silt or fine sands. And we knew that because we were doing a lot of jet grouting at the time, and the jet grout would hit one of these seams and they would go several hundred meters before it would pop out of the ground someplace. So these things have a structure to them. And now if we imagine the structure of the Clay Valley with these draping sediments, the smaller of which are highly permeable, and we imagine this excavation in June of 1993, uh, and then where it was in September of 1993, the excavation, remember now, is a kilometer long, it's 100 meters wide, <coughs> It's coming into this clay valley and it's intercepting these stratifications, these seams that are relatively pervious. And they had intense rainfall in September, which is shown on the right-hand side here. So you have this enormous excavation unloading going on. Of course, if you were able to drain the negative pore water pressures, you would maintain the undrained shear strength because you would just convert the negative pore water pressure for the confining stress at which that clay is having its strength determined, and there wouldn't be much of a change in the undrained strength. But because of the structural interactions here, normally you'd expect that. But in this particular case history, those were able to dissipate the negative pore water pressures, thereby reducing the confining stress on the clay so that the introduction of shears from deepening the excavation were acting on an undrained strength considerably lower than had been characterized prior to this by the Chancep method and other methods that were used. When the excavation got down to a depth of about 13.1 meters, and we're going 20 meters here, so we're way off 20 meters at this point, we experienced what I call the large ground deformation event. A lot of people were calling it failure, and I, I pointed out that things hadn't failed yet. We, the monitoring system worked extremely well. We understood that there were problems. You can see that the displacements here have gone over uh, 200 millimeters, uh, to, between 200 and 300 millimeters. It was getting to be quite significant, and they backfilled the excavation up to a higher elevation and stabilized everything. And then the question was, why? Well, the reason why had to do with this excavation unloading, and we immediately set out to try to characterize what the undrained strength actually was at the time these large ground deformations were absorbed. So that was done by vein field shear tests. I'd worked a lot with Demetrius Kutsoftis, uh, a, a very well-known practitioner in San Francisco, on deep soft excavations there. We had very effectively used the vein shear test. The, the problem with Boston is it has a stiff desiccated crust uh, of about a meter to two meters, and a lot of people try to get their veins down there and break the, 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 the shaft. So you pre-drill through those, and you also um, go down with an adjacent borehole in which you take uh, standard penetration tests or you take a uh, core of material so that you can actually see the stratification because you get sand in some of these things and obviously you're going to get a false positive with the sand. So you have to take those out, concentrate on the vein vehicle tests that are actually testing the clays and we got this distribution of strengths which are shown in red and you can see they are considerably less than that black average line in the range of undrained strength that had been predicted without considering the excavation unloading. So we took the actual field vein shear test values. Um, we took the characterization of the clay, ran finite difference evaluations with flack, and actually came up with a uh, an evaluation for uh, the failure of uh, uh, safety factor uh, for these uh, uh, circular slip surfaces. If we take the vein shear test values and we run a circular slip surface, we were actually coming up with values of factor of safety between about 0.98 and about 1.02 very consistent with the behavior, very consistent in terms of the numerical modeling, in terms of concentrations of shear strain and so forth. Um, what we did then is we went back to this critical slip surface. We defined a number of points along the critical slip surface 
and, and we developed uh, stress path analyses for these based on triaxial extension and direct simple shear and triaxial compression tests. I'm going to look at uh, element C here, which is uh, triaxial extension mode. And uh, looking at point C, what we have is the normalized uh, shear stresses plotted with respect to the normalized um, vertical stresses uh, and horizontal stresses on the clay um, in this diagram. And what you can see is that as we get excavation unloading, we go from Roman numeral number one to Roman numeral number two. Um, we get a negative pore water pressure which is generated with respect to that excavation unloading. And so the actual stress path on the Q versus P plot here, and by, these are normalized with respect to the maximum past effective stress uh, that the soil was subjected to, doesn't change very much because you still have the same confining stress in there. However, if you get unloading, uh, that negative pore pressure goes away and you go from point uh, Roman numeral number A to Roman numeral number B, and you end up now with a stress path to the failure surface in triaxial extension in this example, which gives you a much lower S sub U than you would have gotten if you had done a triaxial extension test and an S sub U based on what you thought were the confining pressures for this clay, not considering the undrained loading. And in this case, there's a 32% difference, which is quite significant. So we ran all those points that you see, and we actually, when we put the right undrained strengths back in there after the, uh, the load path analysis, came up with deep rotational stability numbers of about 0.99 to 1.04. So very significant in the sense that your structure, the possibility of dissipating negative pore water pressures can really change the most fundamental property that's critical for these deep excavations in clay, which is the undrained strength. So we knew why. Now what do you do about it? We couldn't do anything with the existing walls. We were up right against Logan Airport on one side and right against somebody else's inviolable property on the other side. And there was no changing the lanes uh, that were required for the highway system. So fortunately, since we had been using soil mix wall technology for the walls, we just turned it 90 degrees and created shear keys that penetrated into the clay to create a shear reinforcement that would amplify the lack of undrained shear strength by providing limited shear key undrained shear strength in the various panels we were putting there that would then supplement for the loss and we would have adequate safety factor and be able to take this excavation down to its final subgrade, which was another seven meters below where we were and that was pretty significant at the time. So the thought was we're going to put in these shear keys with deep mixing technology. So we get what we call a soil mix buttress. Uh, that has to be connected to the existing wall. So we then did that with jet grout because you can't use soil mix to make a strong contact. That has to be done with a jet grouting technology. And so we were then able to connect the existing wall with a shear key that we could found either in the glacial marine deposits beneath or somewhere uh, in the clay, uh, provided it was deep enough below the base of the excavation. So there's the jet grout there. So here is a picture of the actual shear keys that were used. Uh, I'm going to blow up this inset diagram, and you can see that we have put in something like four different columns of triple auger uh, elements and have expanded those out to what was called the hammerhead uh, to create a stronger connection with the existing wall. And then we couldn't get close enough to stitch the two together. That had to be jet grouted, which was done in that intervening space between the hammerhead and the existing soil mix wall. And the replacement that we used was 35%. That is, we put in shear keys that replaced about 35% of the initial soil. Uh, this was a team that was being run by Muser Rutledge and Nicholson Construction. I was providing advice 
and uh, we were learning as we go, and uh, we believed that this would work. It, it, in fact, did work. It did allow us to get the excavation down. But we learned some very interesting things about the construction in this process. Uh, the deep soil mixing process was developed in Japan primarily for soils that had natural water contents of 75 to 150 percent, very, very soft sediments. Now in Boston, you're applying this for marine clays that have water contents of 35 to 45 percent. And there was some difficulty achieving homogeneity in the deep soil mix as we tried to get these elements into the ground. And what ultimately was decided is on the right hand side, you can see that the method of installing the soil mix columns uh, was to inject water going down, uh, typically two thirds of the water you were going to use or one third, and then inject it coming back up. But we found that injecting it going down was the thing that really mattered. And in essence, what you're doing is if you use your downward installation of the soil mix element to inject your water, you're actually creating an equivalent water content as the Japanese had encountered in their soils. And you could blend this stuff so much better as you retracted your augers, putting the cement into place. So that was a technique that we had to learn. In the Bird Island Flats, remedial action we were getting a what we call cement factor of 4.7 kilonewtons per cubic meter. Now, soil cement factor is defined by the weight of the dry cement that was introduced to the soil relative to the volume of the soil that was being treated. So that was an important number. And then the water cement ratio is an important number. The more cement you put in, uh, the stronger the material gets because it automatically gets attached to a water cement ratio of one, you get a lot of water in here. Uh, and therefore, your replacement, if we look at a, a unit weight diagram, we replace the soil that was there with 52% water, 15% uh, cement, and only 33% of the initial soil. That soil comes out as spoil. So the more cement you use, the more spoil you get. And the more spoil you get, the more expensive it gets to treat and get rid of the spoil. So that's a very important uh, element to understand here. Uh, but we wanted a higher strength there because we just didn't know uh, enough. And we wanted to be conservatively biased to, to have good strength results. What's interesting is that if you now look at a histogram of the unit weight at, let's say, 14 days, uh, the unit weight of this is 14.7 kilonewtons per cubic meter as opposed to the 18.8 kilonewtons per cubic meter of the soil that was originally in place. You, when you introduce cement, replace it with so much water that you actually reduce substantially, in this case about 20%, uh, the unit weight of the soil. And that can become important sometimes in generating frictional resistances in areas below where you want to get some uh, shear resistance at the toe of these elements. Uh, the actual unconfined compressive strength from 150 millimeter diameter specimens, so they were actually casting them initially as you would concrete, and then they eventually went to smaller sizes because we didn't see any difference, um, is quite variable uh, and has a, a, an average uh, strength on the order of about 3.83 meganewtons uh, per square meter. The soil mix buttress conditions were twofold. They, we built what they called a, uh, an anchored buttress, uh, and we built what was called a floating buttress. Um, and you can see the cross sections shown on the left-hand side, where the buttress has been taken all the way through the marine clays and, and, and founded or supported in the marine, uh, glacial marine or glacial sediments beneath. And on the eastern side of the excavation, it was actually floated because there was some concern about differential movement, and they wanted to have a little more deformation relative to some other structures. But one thing we definitely learned is when you're using a floating buttress situation, it jackknifes. So among other things, as you excavate downward, 
and you're looking at the performance of these wide excavations, they heave up in the center and uh, this thing then heaves up with them and that kind of compromises its ability to do what you really want it to do. So for sure, the anchored uh, buttress approach is the best approach and you really do develop a shear key and you can actually measure the shear strain that develops in that kind of situation. The other thing that, that works against working with floating buttresses is you can get deep uh, sliding surfaces that can go behind your tieback anchors and beneath your buttresses and so you have to check those uh, critical slip surfaces and you may not get a good result when you do something of that sort. So what we see on this next slide are some actual measurements of the lateral displacement profiles from the inclinometers. Uh, you can see that there is a height of clay uh, which the deformation uh, is occurring over. Uh, there is the depth of this deep soil mix. Uh, and we have this D sub H which is the horizontal deformation. And this is pretty much a linear trend. So if we take the D sub H and we divide it by the H sub C, you actually get a measurement of the shear strain. And therefore, if I plot the D sub H as a function of the thickness of the low strength clay, H sub C, the slope of that curve is the actual shear strain that's being developed uh, in, in the soil elements. So we can come up with an idea of what shear strains were mobilized uh, to produce the strength from the deep mix elements uh, for the um, uh, Bird Island Flats excavation. We also could uh, model the excavation. There were inclinometers that were placed between the deep soil mix elements. And so we could actually get a measurement, which is shown in this dark line, relative to the analytical values of the shear modulus that we could run with our finite difference programs and comparing what was actually measured with what we were able to monitor uh, we could show that a shear modulus on the order of about 60 meganewtons per square meter matched pretty well the actual distortions which were measured with the inclinometers. And by the way, these inclinometers between these deep soil elements, we also had inclinometers in the deep soil elements, and they were moving in unison. So at a 35% coverage, you had enough shear conveyance between the elements and the soil in between to get them behave as one uh, mass. So there's the inclinometer measurements. And then if we actually take between that 60 and 120 uh, meganewtons or, uh, per square meter, or 240, and we put it back into the analysis, we get a, a good uh, uh, agreement with some local deviations uh, of what the actual displacement of the wall was. So we were able to stabilize the excavation. It didn't mean we didn't incur some movements. We got an additional 150 millimeters of movement because we were using 35% coverage and we were getting a lot of shear strain that was being developed in the actual soil mix elements. Uh, fortunately, when you're next to an airport, it affects the runway not so badly. The planes can still go out. These were taxiways. On the other side, it didn't have an impact on things very much. Uh, we were good. Uh, we could get the excavation done. Then that technology set dormant for about three years until a crisis occurred where at Fort Point Channel, and I'll show this on this Landsat image, um, became the nexus for a lot of political controversy on the artery. The cost of the excavation there ballooned to about $2 billion at this one location. And the way it ballooned was they were compartmentally excavating and supporting it because of the very weak nature of the clays in this location. It's a massive amount of excavation. And in order to stabilize each excavation, they, they made it smaller and then stitched them all together. And when you did it in that fashion, it became very expensive. So the idea then was to actually take the deep mixing technology and convert these clays, which were very weak, to clays which were much stronger by the deep mixing method. And so here's the concept, Fort Point Channel uh, was going to be stabilized with the deep mixing technology to create a central stable mass of ground. On the south side, that is South Boston, which you see in the upper right hand side of the picture on the right, uh, 
that was going to be turned into a casting yard and the actual tubes for the artery were going to be cast and then by immersed tube technology floated out and dropped into place with the stabilized clay. And then on the left bottom corner of this picture, the excavation or the construction had to go underneath the railroad tracks at, at the Union Station there. And to do that, there was freezing of the ground and then uh, jacking of these enormous boxes into place. And of course, stabilizing the central part was critical for getting these other two innovative approaches into place. This actually reduced the cost by about $1.2 billion, putting that back together in that, this way. So here's a cross-section of the soils. Again, you can see these very deep clays in some locations. These clays are, are up to uh, 30 meters uh, in thickness. Same kinds of soil conditions as we saw before. There were two types of uh, soil rigs that were used on this project. One was the biggest rig that existed in the world at the time. It was a triple auger rig that came in from Japan. These things had to go to depths of uh, 40, 45 meters. So these were the deepest depth soil mixers that they had. And they were one and a half meters in diameter. So this was a lot of churning of soil. Those are shown on the left-hand side. That was called the M250 rig. The 608 rig was a 0.9 meter auger rig, counter-rotating triple auger. Again, about 45 meters in depth in terms of penetration. Uh, and you can see this was actually used most recently for the construction of the Transbay Transit Center in San Francisco, which you can see on the very far right-hand side there, you get a, a sense for scale at 45 meters, what we're talking about with the triple auger rig going in under those conditions. Um, the mix installation was putting in the primary panels either side and then putting in a secondary panel that completely overlapped the primary panels by re-augering those two cylinders that are shared between the primary and the secondary panel. And that was done for about 60% of the stabilization uh, for the uh, Fort Point channel. Then for the last 40% to save money and realizing that the, the total overlapping was not necessary, um, there was a 30% overlap change in the design so it looked something like this. If we take a look at the, at the uh, unit weight diagrams, we have the Bird Island Flats on the right and its transformation or evolution into a soil mix that involved water contents of about 0.8 and cement factors of about 2.3. I'm showing the, the unit weight diagram uh, for cement factors of 2.9 and 2.4, all of those were investigated and studied in the field. And now what you're able to do is you reduce the strength, but you reduce the spoil by about 100%, and you have sufficient strength in order to stabilize the ground and control ground movement. Um, there's a lot of interesting properties that were got gathered. Uh, one of the ways that they get information from the soil mix is they come in with a pipe specimen, and they let the soil mix flow into the pipe and then they pull that out. That's called a wet grab specimen. Problem with the wet grab specimens is that there can be unmixed portions of the ground that don't go into this smaller pipe to sample things. And as a consequence, it precludes the measurement of these. So you tend to get more of a sample that reflects cementitious material than unmixed or untreated soil because this becomes a sort of heterogeneous blend at times. Um, if you actually core the specimens, you end up getting a much more reflective uh, specimen that's actually showing what mix and what soil are still in place. And you can see that the mean unit weights are quite different between the two here, going from 15.2 to 16.3. Again, the cores are having a higher unit weight. Uh, they are actually um, gathering um, material that's more reflective of what's being sampled. The unconfined compressive strength also is much different with the wet grab samples. In fact, significantly higher, almost four megapascals. Again, reflecting the fact that you're concentrating cement in those particular samples as opposed to the core samples where you're at 2.68. So clearly, you want to avoid biases. Our preference 
is to do wet grab as a quality control so that the contractor has rapid feedback, but to really pin your evaluation of strength characteristics on what's coming out of the core specimens. Also, the statistical characterizations are different. Normal distributions match unit weights, but log normal distributions, and we did various goodness of fits to validate this, match unconfined compressive strengths. And I see so many specifications that are predicated on assuming that the unconfined compressive strength of soil mix is normally distributed. And believe me, you get a much different answer if you assume that and it's actually normally distributed. For example, your mean is going to be a lot less than your median. So if you're doing some sort of a probabilistic assessment of this, you're going to be wrong. So you need to recognize that these are truly log normally distributed. Since then, we've looked at a lot of them and they've never deviated. So the sampling, wet grab sampling is biased against unmixed soil and low unit weights and high QUs. Uh, we found ultimately that going away from uh, 50 millimeter coring uh, devices to 75 millimeter and 80 millimeter and using triple tube coring gave really good results and those eventually uh, were used. Here are some deep mix soil properties versus time. Uh, and so what you see in this plot is the unconfined compressive strength of the soil mix taken from various in situ installations. Um, and there's really not much change as you go from about 60 days out to 500 days. That doesn't mean that there's not some change in the strength of the soil mix because it's curing. That means that the variability of the data that we're able to get from the field is significant enough that it just doesn't, it's not large enough to show up on a statistical plot of this sort. This next plot's really interesting. We actually were able to collect, and I mean hundreds of specimens. We could take a look at the unconfined compressive strength versus the water cement ratio, and we could take it and plot it as a function of the water cement ratio that was used on a number of sections uh, of, of the artery here. And you'll notice it goes up with a higher, you're not, it's not supposed to do that. Cements don't do this, right? Uh, and it did here because more water meant greater fluidization and a greater ability to mix the soil, which had low water contents to start with, effectively with the cement. So it was the, um, the improvement of the mixing that the water cement ratio was really helpful in reflecting. And then, of course, as the cement factor goes down, um, you'd expect the strength to go down. And, and then the data show these quite clearly. Then they eventually recognized that they could get a strength gain by increasing the water content. They could get a cost reduction by diminishing the cement factor. So they adjusted this thing and got a, a good mix that was much more economical than the original ones that were used. All, they're again showing you the value of the case history because you don't have to go through this. You could actually draw this information in the future. So quality controls that, that worked out. We were looking at minimum and maximum unconfined compressive strength. Remember, we always think we want a minimum, but for Fort Point Channel, you also wanted a maximum because if you're going to be using immersed tube technology to drop the tube in plate, you've got to excavate a bed in the soil mix, and if it's too strong, you can't excavate it with cost-effective excavating equipment. So there was a maximum value set. Triple two barrels were, were going to be used for sampling at 75 millimeter core. We were looking for a less than or equal to 2% horizontal deviation for the panels. Restroking augers at the bottom of the panels and then minimum soil unit weight of 16.5. Again, don't want to get the unit weights too low because when you tow into those glacial tills, you want reasonable frictional resistance, which is going to depend upon the vertical stresses that are acting at that interface. Um, there were a whole bunch of locations uh, in the treated ground that uh, actual tests were done in, plate load tests, shear wave velocity tests, and a whole number of pressure meter tests. And these pressure meter tests were the ones that were used by uh, measuring the, the, the pressure in the pressure meter and then uh, with deflectometers or deflecting uh, foils measure the expansion of the hole. So you get uh, a internal pressure versus radial strain output which then can be fitted to cavity expansion theory. Um, uh, I think those are the best in terms of getting fundamental results out. And so when you, when you use this kind of technology, you're actually 
not looking at the pressure versus radial displacement divided by radius, that black curve, you're actually unloading it. That's generally reflecting a, def um, a, a, a deformed material along the walls of the pressure meter hole. You want to unload it and then reload it, and we're actually looking for that reloading modulus as the basis for estimating what the modulus or the shear modulus of the soil is. Turns out that we can go to telecommunications. We can use what's called digital filtering theory uh, of the pressure meter data, where you actually take the force displacements, which are a bit wavy, uh, convert them into a frequency domain, do a Fourier transform, bring that out into a differentiable equation, and you can refine your pressure meter data. And we wrote a paper on this. This is shown up there. Uh, uh, Yu Wang, one of my students, uh, in terms of how you use this telecommunication uh, signal conditioning theory to come up with very fine refinements of what the uh, shear modulus degradation looks like as a function of radial strain, which is your engineering strain. It's the shear strain divided by two. And you can see that we could distinguish beneath 30 meters a shear modulus degradation plot and um, above 30 meters, and below 30 meters is because we had multiple restroking so that there was more stronger material put in there. The one that we felt that we needed to go with was the one that was less than 30 meters because that was having the most important effect on the excavation. And when you compare this with the GG Max curves established in the laboratory, if we convert the lower one, we get really good relationships. Here is our actual uh, shear modulus degradation that we actually developed for a fourth point channel relative to the plate load test, the laboratory tests, and the Bird Island flat buttress measurements. There's really good agreement among them. There's some uncertainty, so we've given a range in here. And then we actually could take this information and we could model uh, the excavation response at what they call Gramp D, uh, where we have one of the exit ramps going by the post office. The post office had a, a, a support wall in front of it, which was a massive T wall. And then the soil in front of this T wall, so the wall was quite stiff, and then the soil was treated at about 85% coverage to convert it from a soft clay to a much harder, stiffer clay. Here's a picture of the clay. I always like to, 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 to liken deep soil mixing as taking a soft marine clay and making a glacial till out of it. Basically, when you're finished, you go back and you look at this clay, it feels just like a hard glacial till. And here are some inclinometer measurements as the excavation was taken down from the 23rd November 99 to March 1st uh, 2000 levels. You're getting very small movements, cantilever displacement associated with the T-wall uh, of, of less than 3 tenths of an inch, so of just a few millimeters. And when we actually use the G max value from our seismic velocity measurements, we actually could match the actual deformations of these inclinometers, uh, thereby showing that the stiffness that was imparted to the clay and the stiffness that came from the T-wall reduced strains to a level where you actually reduce the modulus, which then reduces the deformation. There is a connectivity here. And if you make things so stiff that you can't get much deformation, then you're going to be dealing with the G-max. And if you use the G-max in this case, you duplicate almost perfectly uh, what was measured uh, in the field. So this reciprocity between stiffness and reduction of deformation. If you reduce your stiffness small enough, there is a limit. It's the elastic limit defined by the G max of the material. That's as low as you can go. And if we look at something like the system stiffness approach, which Wayne Clough and I worked on a number of years ago, the question has always been, how low can you go? Well, it turns out that uh, picking up some of these lessons from the artery, we can go to about 0.05% strain uh, in terms of technology to support walls and, and keep things in place, which is a good number to have in your pocket. Now, whether you want to stiffen things up to get that lowest strain depends upon if there's a structure that needs to be protected to that level, right? It's very expensive to do this.
I would not say that I would do 85% coverage in the artery again. I think we could have gotten away with a lot less. We did when we went to uh, Fort Point Channel, but there we were lucky. We didn't cause any damage to structures because there wasn't real structures next to us. We had uh, the post office right next to us on Fort Point Channel, uh, and therefore we wouldn't have done 35%, but I don't think we would do 85 either. So the nice thing about this case history is that it's two bounds for terms of the performance. So last part of the lecture, lessons learned. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly because in order to save time, but this undrained shear strength is a key parameter. And as we've seen, that the soil structure can play a critical role in the undrained strength reduction, and you need to evaluate the effects of excavation unloading on the base stability in clay. If you don't have a structure that's going to dissipate negative pore water pressures, then you can probably assume that the S sub U is okay based on our conventional design methods, but you need to think about it. Deep mixed walls can be relatively pervious in clay, and therefore, we don't need to design for full hydrostatic. We can do something more in line with uh, steady state. The wet grab sampling tends to be biased to strengths which are not appropriate and, and at high and low unit weights. Unit weight is normally distributed and Uh, unconfined compressive strength for the deep soil mix increases with water cement ratio. Pressure meter, very valuable in defining G, uh, secant versus the shear strain relationships, uh, which we used effectively on Fort Point Channel. Uh, the wall movement was uh, eventually controlled to, to less than 12 millimeters, and a very favorable agreement between the analytical and measured movements uh, and very stiff walls with base stabilization promoting. Uh, wall movements to, to less uh, or approximately 0.05 percent. And then finally, the Bird Island Flats was a deep soil mix solution done under distress, right? Done under duress. We were holding up a $275 million project, which was critical path. We put together a solution which got the excavation down, but in the process generated shear strains in the soil mix elements. Now, these are more rigid than clays, of course, at about 0.6 percent which gave us a G secant of, of about 10% of G max, so we're really low now, right? And we figured that the strength we had mobilized was about 50%, which is about as much as you'd ever want to go. So that case history is right at where you'd want to push the technology, and therefore I think represents a very valuable case history uh, point in reality. Fort Point Channel was the opposite story. It was something where we really treated it, really put in a stiff wall, wanting to control movements, and we're able to do that and actually create a situation where GMAX was controlling performance. Some final comments about the Boston artery in terms of cost increases. When the Boston artery was evaluated back in uh, 1986, I think it was uh, evaluated at a $2.6 billion cost. It eventually came in at about $14.6 or $14.7 billion. But comparing it to 1986 before the environmental impact statement was developed is, of course, nonsense. It's not fair. If we actually take it at a time about 1993-94 when the EIS is in place, um, it was about 5.6 to $6 billion at that time. So the artery actually went from about a six, let's call it a five and a half billion to a 14.7 billion cost increase. So almost threefold. When you look at the reasons for that increase, about 55% of this is inflation over 15 years. And that nested in that inflation is the fact that they change scope. If you change scope on a mega project, you are doomed because you are going to have to slow things up, redesign, reevaluate, redo partial EISs, which take more time. And then that expands the time and, and increases the cost of money. Here they introduced high occupancy vehicle lanes which was not part of the original design, that had an enormous impact on cost. When they built the channel tunnel, they changed the whole safety configuration of the trains in the middle of building the channel tunnel. That had enormous impact on cost on that project too. And then by delaying things, you just compound that increase in cost by virtue of the cost of borrowing money that moves you down the, the lane. So if we compare the Boston Artery to other mega projects, including the Manai Bridge, Stevenson's Great Bridge to Anglesey, right? From, it was breaking technology at the time because it was the world's first 
cable supported bridge and it was delivered at three times its initial cost estimate and about five years over budget. Same thing with the Brooklyn Bridge, same thing with the Panama Canal, same thing with the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, and the same thing with the Channel Tunnel. Typically, two and a half times the cost at the start of construction, if I average all these things out, and about two to four years late. I put the superconducting super collider in there because that was a project I was involved in back in the 90s at the same time as the Boston Artery. It was never built. It went over budget. Uh, it was stopped at a, an investment of about $3 billion. It was supposed to come in at about $3 billion, and at this point they only had like 25% uh, of the tunnels in place. Uh, and the cost had gone up to about $12 billion at that time, and they decided to uh, abandon it. And I always say that the other projects they kept were transportation projects. But the super collider was a transportation project also, except it was for protons. <laughs> and as a consequence, there just wasn't the compelling urgency, it seemed, on the part of the Congress and other locations to see that project through. But concentrating on those infrastructure transportation projects, the Manai Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge, Panama Canal, Trans-Alaska Pipeline, and Channel Tunnel, those cost overruns were worth every penny of it. No one to this day would want to do without those important infrastructure. And the, pro the benefits are societal, they're economic commercial advantages, there's technological advancements. And part of the reason that these projects get held up are exactly what I just told you about. We were inventing some of this stuff by the seat of our pants as we went on, like this undrained strength and dealing with the uh, soil mix elements and so forth. So coming out of this struggle, and it's always a struggle, is, is a step increase in improvement and effectiveness. And then, what is $14.6 billion? There is a structure along Atlantic Avenue that's called One Financial Center, which is the Boston home of the American Insurance Group, AIG. And I've showed you on the left-hand side here, they had an excavation that was 40 meters deep. Next to One Financial Center, which only went down about 20 meters or so, or 15 meters to its bottom. Um, and you could put the Statue of Liberty in this excavation, it was so deep. Um, AIG, during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, was bailed out by the United States government for $182 billion. Now, a lot of that has purportedly been returned because of the sales of stock and so forth. But what does infrastructure cost and what is the relative cost of other things? I mean, we, we have a new normal that we deal with in the world these days. And so I always like to say that when we're putting infrastructure into place, it's really urban regeneration. And what the Boston Artery did, besides being controversial with some of the cost overruns, and besides uh, generating these comparisons with other mega projects to put it into perspective, it completely transformed Boston. And uh, when I go back to Boston these days, I'm very proud of the work that we did there because it really had a major impact on that city. And that's what we do as geotechnical civil engineers. We improve society by improving the services, resources, and structures and facilities that people work with, and in the process, improving the communities that, that, that work with those things. So that's my talk, and I've been, it's been a great pleasure to be able to deliver it for you. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much. That was really a pleasurable and very interesting. And uh, I learned a lot uh, today, so I really appreciate that. My pleasure. Uh, at this point, would you like to take a short break or some water before you... Uh, oh, I'm fine. If, if you have questions, I, I might just take a little bit of Perrier here. Okay. And online, you can uh, contact uh, uh, Professor Yannick Etier with uh, the chat application or send him a message to be uh, unmuted. And here you can just uh, raise your hand. Hi. I'm Yes. Um, you raised a good point about costs and cost overrun and things like that. We find that in today's bids, uh, there's a high demand for control of costs, um, almost 50 50 depending. Um, we try to you know, promote soil mixing and jet routing as wherever we can and wherever it's feasible. Sure. But the perception I'm getting as a designer trying to bid with these things is, yeah, it could work, but the certainty of getting the right strength, the right overlap, 
between columns, the certainty of your parameters in general is deemed less than, say, a second part wall or a slurry wall where you can just control the strength of your wall by design and they control your costs in the bid. And we end up not having these items and bids just because the contractors don't like the lack of control. Is this something you're familiar with or do you, do you think that it's just a bit of a, because it's a, it's a new technology? To go so it, it's like some of my British friends say, horses for courses, right? So the, um, I think, I think um, secant files have really become quite popular because they can be quite stiff. Uh, the, the way they're installed is with the casing, a rotational casing. You don't lose a lot of ground. Slurry walls, you can actually lose ground when you put panels in. So depending upon the soil conditions, the actual installation of a slurry wall can incur movement, which then adds to others uh, and is often not considered, but it actually should be considered when you're looking at these things. Secants don't quite work that way. You may have to worry about some vibrational issues if you have loose materials nearby, but even then it's probably minimal. Uh, and they work very well. However, if you're dealing with really soft soil sites and uh, you have issues with regard to base stability, um, an effective way is strengthening up the soils. That, that's always something that can be used. And uh, if they're deep enough, so it's not just the fact that you have a soft clay, but it's got to be a really deep soft clay. Because then if you go below the bottom of your excavation and you have a stiff wall, a sea camp pile wall, and it's, it's going down, let's say, 20 meters before it intersects into something that's stiff, like in San Francisco and a whole bunch of other places we could think of, that's just too deep. There's, there's enough deflection on that wall, because the only place you're able to support it is with the bottom brace and the embedment at great depth, and it's going to deflect. So here, Soil mix wall could be effective. Uh, and I would guess a soil mix with a jet grout uh, connection would be the most cost effective because jet grouting is just like super expensive, period. So I hope I, I mean, it's really, you're quite right. There's, uh, there's certain amount of uncertainty with soil mixing, but you know, even, so let's pick an era project uh, of Trans Bay Transit Center, excellent. Uh, soil mix wall technology. The soil mix walls went in there, they look great, uh, and they performed well. Yes, uh, Francois Giroux, Hydro Quebec. From my understanding, you treat the in situ clay using uh, cement and you create the soil column in, in situ, so with the, the in situ clay. Is the uh, chemical properties of the clay or salinity might be an issue with uh, using this metal? No, uh, I, I think we, we pretty well established that salinity isn't an issue. You can perform a lot of concrete in saline environments. There's lots of examples if you've got the mix right, and, and, the, and that performs well for, for many, many years after the pours. Uh, if you do have organics, that will retard uh, curing, and you will get less strength. And uh, installing deep soil mixes in, um, in high pH environments with organics, uh, you can expect strength reduction. There's a number of papers that you can refer to to get a sense for this. Uh, and you can also expect uh, a much longer curing time so you don't mobilize the strength for, for a fair long period of time. Um, and as I say, there's information out that you can evaluate this, but that's probably where the greatest challenges are in terms of chemistry to its performance long term. Okay, my last question is, uh, have you experienced that method in uh, quickly, very high sensitivity that comes in liquid doing this uh, deep soil mixing? Well, sure, you have Lita clay here, right? So you, you get quick clays, and of course you, you have quick clays in Norway and other locations like that, so highly sensitive clays. Um, with the deep mixing, could be a problem. I mean, I, we just, I don't know of anyone who's actually done this in what we would call quick clay. So where we have a sensitivity of, let's say, 25 or greater, uh, you, that's such a, a large transformation that um, disturbing that may actually cause continuous failure around the shaft that you're trying to put in. 
always with these projects, you, you need to do some sort of a field trial to fine tune it for your site. So one could, if they were worried about sensitivity, uh, actually do the field trial and, and, and confirm that it was going to work or not. Any other questions here? Oh, this one. Good question. Thank you. No one's ever brought that up, so that's a really good question. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Master from here. I have two questions. The first one is that I found that you used a pressure meter test to find the young nodules soil. I was wondering why did you only use this specific test? Because, you know, the, I'm not sure about I mean, this, I mean, the statement, but I think the value of the young nodules we got from the, from the different tests from the test, the function of the amount of the string we apply on that. For example, the shear wave velocity, pressure meter, tertiary axial test, we can get the young nodules from each of them, but the value is not the same, and it's the function of the amount of the string that we're going to have in our project. So, uh, did you only use the pressure meter in this uh, specific project, two projects you mentioned, to find and evaluate the G max value and the, I mean, the stiffness? No, the, the pressure meter was quite the workhorse because uh, if you use it appropriately and you expand out your, your pressure meter and, and get deformations, uh, significant deformations in terms of radial strain, as I said, you can use signal processing and you can, you can tease out of that data uh, very good uh, G secant versus strain uh, relationships. But we also, uh, and, and it was so revealing and so valuable that that was kind of the backbone, but we didn't just rely on that. We, we also did uh, shear wave velocity tests, and those shear wave velocity tests at the G maxes, and then we did plate load tests. Now, you have to make assumptions with plate load tests, too, and uh, if you read the Peck lecture, which you know, has, was published by ASCE, uh, we explain how we use the, the, the plate load tests, and I plotted those up there. You can actually use the uh, samples, too, of the soil mix and uh, uh, the track still, or excuse me, the unconfined compression test results in terms of uh, 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 stress-strain relationship to, to back out uh, the GC can for those samples, too. And those are all uh, plotted up there, and what you see is the pressure meter forming this nice backbone coming down and then going out over here and the plate load tests overlapping it very nicely, the laboratory tests overlapping it very nicely on the extreme part, and then the, the, the G-max from the uh, seismic velocity tests overlapping it very nicely on the, the upper part. So we didn't just, re, uh, we didn't just rely on the pressure meter. I, I was very very cautious about this. I have to give uh, Yu Wang, my student, a lot of credit here because he's the one that actually um, uh, devised this method on the basis of some people that he knew had, had been working on this. And uh, I, of course, as the professor, wanted to be skeptical about this and uh, insisted that we look at other methods uh, to tie everything together. And uh, second thing I just, I, uh, after the so we see it's now that there's a kind of an anchorage uh, using the anchor in the wall. It was only an anchor or nailing. Oh, it's an anchor. So these, these are pressure injected anchors. They had may anchor le lengths that, that may have been on the order of uh, 10 meters or so, and uh, they were uh, post grouted. So they they had. Uh, tubes in there that they could come back and repressurize them, and that creates a kind of a claquage. So you break through the initial grout, and you split in, and we excavated a couple of these things, and you saw these splays of cement going out in all different directions, so it's now like a root. Uh, so you pull on it, it's a lot more resistance. And, and, uh, and those seem to work very well. Now, the drawback is that if you anchor in a low modulus material, it's still deforming behind the anchor, right, in, in terms of excavation release. So we actually could tease out how much moving movement was occurring behind these anchors, and it was up to 75 millimeters moving behind the anchors, because these are huge excavations, and they're relieving quite a lot of stress, and though there's a lot of deformation. So the, the benefit was you were able to put these excavations down. You were able to do it in a, a relatively cost-effective fashion. They're so huge. There's no way you could have put a cross-off braces there. How, how, could you, how could you even make it stiff enough to do anything, right? 
Uh, it would be controlled by buckling modes of deformation throughout the entire length. It would be impossibly cost inefficient. So they got this to work, but, but there's always a trade-off. And then in this case, the trade-off was you couldn't control your movements as well as you would have liked to. When we went to, to uh, Fort Point Channel, we put the T-walls in, which are pretty solid to start with, and then had a higher treatment uh, to make sure that we could control the movements there. There's a question over there. Uh, I'm a PhD student from Polytechnic in Montreal, and I have some questions for you. And the first question is because in the first slide, you also mentioned the wet technology, I'm sorry, the dry technology for mixing. So I, I get confused because uh, you said that mostly in Boston, you just apply the, the wet technology. That's so correct. My question is whenever you also apply the dry technology, because uh, I think the moisture content of the soil is just 30 to 35 percent, so it's quite low. So it is possible to, to apply the dry technology. Well, so, so here, so when you do the dry, you, 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 you even increase your variability that much more. Because what you're doing is you're mixing in only the dry powder. It could be lime, it, 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 which is known to stabilize soils. And it could be cement. Uh, and they often use it in Scandinavia, for example, to support railroad embankments in, in soft ground conditions where you may have some soft ground that may be 20 meters or uh, maybe 20 feet, excuse me, uh, on the order of six, seven, eight meters thickness. And drilling down and injecting the dry cement, there's enough inherent moisture content to hydrate and create a cementation that kind of build, binds the things together. But it's going to be much more variable spatially and give you a lower strength product in the end. So again, it's this horses for courses. The, the dry works for these well-defined circumstances where you're not trying to treat too much and you're trying to get a strength gain which is not uh, really high. Uh, whereas in Boston, these, this was big, heavy, serious construction and, and having this stuff blended together in a wet mode was essential for producing the higher strengths. Okay. And my second question is related to the shape. The columns, uh, because uh, when you use the uh, jet mounting, uh, from my experience, it's really difficult to, to control the cylinder shape of the columns. And as far as I know, maybe one or two years ago, you need to uh, make some improvement of the machine to, to better control the shape of the columns. So, do you have any problems? Yeah, so jet grouting is very tricky. I mean, you almost always can get 1.2 meter column. Uh, it's very difficult to get a, a 1.8 meter column. Um, and there's often the claim that you'll get a 1.8 meter column by the people who want to put the jet grout in the place. And uh, you may or may not get that. Um, so what you would do here is you bring the soil mix to within 1.2 meters. And, and then you have an excellent chance. Uh, I think it's all in the closure, right? So if you, if you get them close enough, uh, jet grout can, can make that connection. If it's, if it's 0.9 to 1.2 meters, I'm pretty comfortable with it. Other questions in the room here? All two questions. Did you pose any question in French? Did you ever repeat in English? Do you? No? Uh, Yannick, any questions or Zoom? Go on, last. Okay, I have one question. Sure. For the modeling in flat, what the model did you use to model the, the soft clay? Uh, we used uh, a Tresca, so we, we used a more, more, more Coulomb strength criteria. Those were pretty, I'm going to put it, um, popular at that time. And they tended to give really good results, so we were very satisfied with the, the numerical results we got. They were sufficient for the questions that we were asking. Uh, and so you just take phi equal to zero, get a Tresca condition, and then you have a, essentially a cylindrical type of, uh, of uh, yield surface, and, and then they have a certain uh, uh, yield direction law that is incorporated into the flat model. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, last chance for questions? No? Thank you again.
presentation is going to be Scorlene, so not just sit the LinkedIn. Uh, I should set that for me. This is what. Oh, thanks a lot. It's an interesting talk, isn't it?